To me, I don't really get anything out of it because it's more or less like they're putting on a show. And it's stupid to me. But anyway, I told them that I wasn't coming, right? And I told them that I was coming here and they told me that I'm doing the wrong thing and I shouldn't come because all you people do is um, you worship idols and um, you worship Allah and Allah is not God. It's just a man that you made up. And you brainwash people and that I'll be getting myself into the wrong thing. Well, I just showed you a law in the Bible, right? Yes. Eli? Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't know about what idols we worship. I mean, I've been to a Catholic church, and they got Saint this, Saint that, Saint rice, Saint butter, Saint cheese. And you say, uh, excuse me, aren't you worshiping idols? No. You say that statue of Mary is not an idol? No. And you know the funny thing about the Catholic church? You be in the same church, and on one side of the room, Mary and holding Jesus. On the other side of the room, Jesus is standing over there. On the other side of the room, Jesus is up on the cross. On the other side of the room, Jesus is down on the floor, taking down on the cross. They got about ten Jesuses going on in one church. When he gets ready to pray, you don't even know which one to turn to. Should I, should I pray to him as a child, or should I pray to him as a man? Should I pray to him as a man who came down the cross? Should I pray to him as a man on the cross? Which one of these statues should I turn to? And every one of them they'll tell you is not a statue. You can walk up and hit the thing with your hand, you know, touch it. It's a rock. Someone painted the lips. Paint the eyes, put clothes on it, and then you say, that's not an idol. The Bible says do not make any images, any graven images, of any likenesses of the Most High. And that don't mean you can't have pictures of your mother and father and your sister and your brother. It means you should not make any type of God statue to emulate the Heavenly Father. Well, if they're saying Jesus is God, and they got the statue of him down on the cross, I would think that the last thing Jesus would want people to remember, he would prefer you have a picture of him sitting down with his disciples, which is another strange picture, because everybody's on one side of the table, which means they were posing for the picture. Have you ever seen somebody go to dinner and everybody's on one side of the table? So that means they all got together and said, let's take this picture. You know what? They confessed to it themselves. They call it the greatest story ever told. They tell you it's the best lie that they ever came up with. The greatest story ever told. They tell it to you all the time. They say, this is not Christmas, this is Xmas. I mean, it's not really a mask. And then you say, oh, Xmas, and you spray Xmas on your window. Mm -hmm. The devil is powerful. He's very powerful. But we'll defeat him if we keep trying. And then, um, I have a, a chain with a cross going it, right, that I wear on my neck. And someone told me that, that means, but I just wear it, it's just, just a chain to me. But the moment you wear it because it symbolizes someone who died for your sins because you think that you speed in the car and crash that somebody else is going to get hurt, which is what they teach you in Christian church when they say Jesus died for your sins, right? Uh -huh. Well, if Jesus died for your sins, what are they calling all those things people are doing in the world today? Mm -hmm. Jesus died for your sins, there'd be no more sins, right? True. He died for the sins of all men. And every day on the news, somebody <laughs> commits another sin. It's a big lie. No one can die for your sins. You know who made that up? Paul. You know what he said? He said, Jesus died for your sins according to the scriptures. You got to read these books. He didn't say he died for your sins blank. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and see. Now this is Paul, the self-proclaimed disciple. Right? And he said, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach past tense unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. He said, I'm only giving you the gospel that I preach. He was not giving them any of the other books. He wasn't giving the book of Revelation. He wasn't going to give them any of Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John. He's only giving them his book, by which also ye are saved. He said his books will save you. The book of Revelation, chapter 22, says that you get saved by the book of Revelation. Paul did not write the book of Revelation. But he said, you're going to get saved by his book. If you keep in memory, what, what? What? What I preach to you. Right? Mm -hmm. Unless you believe in vain. Paul just knocks off all the other disciples and builds himself here and says, you have to believe in my book and what I teach you. If not, your teachings are in vain. Now he tells you what he taught. For I, Paul, delivered or given unto you first of all which I also received. He said, I'm only giving you the revelations which I was given. How that the Messiah 
meaning Christ, to them, did what? He died for our sins according to the scriptures. Not by what I know. I'm saying that I read that somebody died for our sins. That's what he said, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, what? According to, according to the scripture. Not according to what he knew. And that he was seen in Cyprus. Now watch him make a big mistake. Then up to 12. Now let's get this straight. If Jesus had 12 disciples, right? Uh-huh. And one of them portrayed him. 12 take away one is what? Seven. That's right. Now how did 12 of them see him after the crucifixion when Judas was supposed to be dead? You see the mistake? Mm-hmm. He's saying, on number four, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen in Cyprus, which was after the so-called crucifixion, then of the twelve. What twelve? There's only eleven disciples now. Judas is dead. Paul made a mistake. But he's going to make another mistake right after that. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at one time. After the 12 saw him, then 500 other brothers saw him, of whom a great part remain unto the present, but some are fallen asleep. He was seen by 500 men after he was seen by the 12. Most of them are still in the church. Some of them have fallen back out. Now, how could these men have seen Jesus in the spirit, resurrected, and fall away from the church? All of them didn't stay in the church, he said. How did they fall back asleep? Watch this now. After that, he was seen of James, that's Jesus' brother, who was also one of his disciples. Now we're not only subtracting one from twelve, we got to subtract two from twelve, we're now down to ten. Another mistake. Then, of all of the apostles. Now then, if all the apostles were then, then who was the twelve or the eleven, or was it the ten, that he saw right after he came from Cyprus? You understand? Mm-hmm. This guy, Paul, is a lunatic. When he came back um, on the third day, did he come back in the flesh or in the Holy Spirit? What did he say? He said, I'm hungry. Give me some meat. I want to see a spirit eat a sandwich. So why was it when he came back, you know, the, the, um, the two or three ladies that were supposed to be sitting there on the rock, and when he came out, they were frightened because they didn't know who he was? Because he was disguised as a gardener, like Mary Magdalene said. When Mary Magdalene got there in the early morn, she walked up to a man and said, Sir, have you seen my master? And he told around and said, Behold, our master. And Mary Magdalene said, I thought that thou was a gardener. Now, if Jesus was dressed the way he was dressed when they supposed to have crucified him, which he couldn't have been because they say they snatched his robe when they were fighting in the garden, so the Romans had the robe, so whatever he had on made her think that he was a what? Now, they also thought he had died, right? Uh-huh. So what did she see when she turned around? Who was standing there? A man. And then she reached out to do what? Touch him. And what did he say? He told her not to be scared. Don't touch me because oh, I have not done what yet? I have not ascended yet. He told her, don't touch me because I have not ascended yet. I am not a spirit yet. I have not died yet. Don't celebrate because it's still on. But, he told her, but, or however, go tell the disciples that I did. Mm-hmm. So he told her that he didn't, but to go and tell the disciples that I did. You understand? Mm-hmm. So when they saw Jesus the next day, according to them, Jesus was a man alive. What did the two angels in the tomb say? Why do you seek for the living amongst the dead? Why do you come to a tomb to look for a man who's alive? This is a place for dead people. And another point, if Jesus did resurrect in the spirit, right, uh-huh. why did they have to move the stone then? Uh-huh. Why would they have to open the stone to the cage? If he was a spirit, he'd go right through the stone. And Christians believe he goes through things because they said he went to the shroud of Terence and left his impression on that shroud, right? So they say he goes through things. Why did they have to roll back the stone to get him out then? If he was in that stone, he was a spirit, he would have went right through that stone, correct? They don't have their story together. I just finished the book, Was Christ Crucified, this week. It'll be out in about, I guess, in about two weeks. Um, 
You know what group? I mean, when Jesus was crucified, right, on the cross that none of the disciples were there to witness the crucifixion of him, right? So they said that, how can you be certain that it was Jesus Christ that was crucified or Judas that was crucified on the cross instead of him? Tell her because what they don't want to confess to is that there was another man called Barnabas. And this other man who happened to be Jesus' half-brother, who's also called Jose, also had a scripture that the popes took out of the Bible. And in his scripture, the scriptures of Barnabas, he makes it very clear that it was Judas who was crucified and not Jesus. Unfortunately, the modern-day Christians don't have this book. So why, did they, so why didn't they put it in? Because also in that book, he predicts the coming of the Comforter by name. He says the Comforter's name is to be Ahmed. And that would defeat the Popehood. Because that meant that after Jesus, they should not have any hierarchy until this man named Ahmed came. And the man Ahmed did happen not to come as a Christian. When they searched the world, they found a man popped up 570 years after Jesus named Ahmed, which is another name for Muhammad, the same way Abraham is a name for Abraham. And they realized that this man was not a Christian and did not comply to their teachings and did not agree with the things they said, but he glorified Jesus' holy name because Jesus is mentioned in the Quran more than any other prophet. That man Ahmed was none other than the prophet Muhammad. And when the popes realized that, and if they would have to give up their seats of authority, they took those books out and hid them from the public. Who gave the, the scrolls to Muhammad from the mountain saying that it was the last testament? That's the al -Quran. The angel Gabriel came to Muhammad and gave him the revelation. You know where you see it at? Yeah. You see it in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Chapter 10. Turn to Revelation chapter 10, and they're going to tell you about the Holy Quran. Now, the point is, remember, this is the book of Revelation revealed 96 years after Jesus' time of rule or time of teaching. All when right? He, when he speaks of the comfort of coming, right, someone after him, who is he speaking of? Muhammad coming after That's him? That's exactly who he's speaking of. Muhammad, who would have the Holy Ghost with him. The Holy Ghost has always been known as the Angel Gabriel. All right? Mm -hmm. And also, in the Holy Quran, 97, it actually tells us that all the angels came down and Aruhu. Tanazalu malaikati wa ruhu. All of the angels came down to Muhammad and the spirit, Aruhu, was with them. Isaiah 29, 12 of the Bible will tell you that there's a prophet who is being given a book who can't read. Let's go there and see what it says. Wait a minute. Start at 11. Isaiah 29, 11. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book. Isaiah 11, chapter Isaiah 11? 29, verse 11. Oh, 29, 11. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the vision of all has become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. Now remember, all five books of Moses had already been revealed. This is the book of Isaiah, a book of prophecy. All right? Mm -hmm. So don't let them tell you that's the Old Testament, because it's not. That was finished by the time this book came. Go ahead. Has been delivered. Which means delivered to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. But an angel is telling Muhammad to read, and Muhammad is saying, I cannot read. Because he can't read. He couldn't read or write. That's right. He was illiterate. Now read number 12. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned. See? Saying, read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I am not. Now they say, the Christians, this is the book of Revelation or the Old Testament. First of all, it tells you that Jesus was able to read because when Jesus was 13 years old, he was studying in the temple of Jerusalem with the elders. So he was learned, right? They can't say this is Moses, because Moses was educated in Egypt, correct? So that eliminates the Old and the New Testament. So what book are we talking about that's being delivered to some prophet who is not educated? Muhammad, you know why? Because he wasn't educated in the Torah, in the books of Moses. He was an illiterate man. They referred to him as an ummi. He wasn't learned in the scriptures. And right in this book it tells you, and it goes on to say, Wherefore the Lord said, for as much as what? This people. Draw near 
kissed me with their mouth That's and with their lips to honor me. Uh-huh. But have removed their heart far from me, and their fear taught me is taught by the... You know why? Because he's talking to the children of Israel, saying, these people pray and honor me, but what about their heart? Where's their heart at? Far from me. So go ahead. Therefore... And their fear taught me is taught by the precept of men. That's right. They live by the Talmud now, the way Muslims are being forced into reading Hadith, and they're leaving the words of Allah, and they're becoming Hadith studiers. The same thing happened in Israel. Those people left the Torah and started reading the Talmud and started being taught by the doctrines of men, interpretations of the scriptures, instead of the scriptures. Go ahead. Therefore, behold. Behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among these people. Even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish. The Israelites' wisdom is going to perish. And what's going to happen? And the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. You won't even see it. Woe unto them that seek Seek to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark, and they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? You see? They're talking about the children of Israel, and the verse 19 will confirm it. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor man shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. So that means they're speaking of someone outside of Israel from Abraham's seed. 22. Therefore thus said the Lord, who, who Abraham concerning the house of Jacob shall not now be ashamed, shame, neither shall his face now wax pale. That means the children of Israel, the seed of Jacob, is going to have to reconcile with a new prophet who's going to bring a book, who's not going to be one of them, who didn't read their doctrine beforehand, who's going to be illiterate. And if you want to go where Moses confirms it, turn your books to Deuteronomy 18. Chapter 18? Yes. Go to verse 15 so it comes into it. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. You there? Yes. The Lord... The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee. Of thy brethren like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. Now this is Moses telling the children of Israel that the Lord, the Creator, is going to raise up a prophet from amongst the brothers of Israel, which are the Ishmaelites, and this prophet's going to be just like Moses, a lawgiver. The same thing that they spoke about, which is Muhammad. Go ahead. And what did he say you should do to him? According to... You should hearken unto him. Oh. When Muhammad comes, the Israelites were supposed to come under the banner of El Islam. Go on, according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God and Haram. That's Haram, where Moses Harab. ascended up. That's where Moses ascended from the mountain Haram. Go ahead. In the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. Because that's where he spoke of him receiving the revelation. You see? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. Now what does he say he's going to do? I will raise them up. A prophet from among their brethren like unto thee. Like Moses. And will put my words in his mouth. The Quran was put in Muhammad's mouth because he was unlearned and uneducated. He couldn't read it himself. Go ahead. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command. And that's all Muhammad did. He didn't have no opinions about anything himself. All he did is spoke what the Quran said. And they teach us that in Islam, if you read it, even in the most simple book that Muhammad proclaimed is that he was up in a mountain meditating and the angel Gabriel came to him and said, Muhammad, read. And he said, Gabriel, I can't read. Muhammad, read. Gabriel, I can't read. And he said, Muhammad, read in the name of your creator, the saint who creates. Right? Yes. That's a recognized historical fact that all of them recognize. But then when they see all these things match up and make sense, they still don't recognize that Muhammad was the comfort that Jesus spoke about and was that prophet from amongst the brethren of Israel that Moses spoke about that would come in the latter day with the word of the Most High to redeem his people. And Muhammad taught Muslims after Christianity to expect the Messiah to come. He first said the Mahdi would come out of his family, and then after the Mahdi, he said at the end of the world, the Messiah, Jesus, would return as a savior. That's part of Islamic teaching. Muslims just don't like to confess that reality because they can't explain it. Being, but, that, go ahead. being that they tell you what it's about right here, why they won't accept the fact that the Quran is the last testament, and they make it seem as though the Quran is um, a whole different Bible. I'll tell you plainly why. Let's go back to where we started. Revelations chapter 10. 
Now John is speaking again. Revelation chapter 10 verse 1. John says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with white. This is the angel Gabriel. Muhammad's in a cave. Remember the story that they tell you about Muhammad? He's sitting in a cave and the angel comes down to him. And they always say in American cliches, if Muhammad didn't go to the mountain, the mountain would have came to Muhammad. It's one of their jokes, but it's a very profound joke. All right, because the angel came down when Muhammad was in the cloud. They always use clouds to symbolize when people are either going up to heaven or coming down. Jesus was taken up in a whirlwind of clouds. They come in a cloud. Clouds are symbolizing the presence of the almighty or angelic beings or even what you might call presently UFO. All right, because they also have seen them come in clouds and go in clouds. And what does he say? And the rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it was the sun. And it's Make note now, I have to keep cutting you off. Make note that this one's rainbow is not green. This one's rainbow is like the brightness of the sun. The other one I spoke about in earlier revelation, his rainbow was green, which is Melchizedek El Khidr. This one here is like the sun, the light. It's luminous and gold and bright like white light. Okay? And his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. That's because of a section in the Holy Quran called Humazah where the Holy Prophet Muhammad speaks about when an angel would come to him and how people would slander him for saying that he was a prophet and call him a false prophet and they laugh and they say they will be cast into hell's fire with like pillars of stone erected. Go ahead. And he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. And the trip about this little book is if you go to the Jehovah Witnesses book on commentaries if you go to the Seven Day Adventist book on commentary of the Revelation, they all say, I don't know what this book is. Because they realize that they say it's a scroll, but the word they use is kitab, not suffer. The word suffer is scroll, and the word kitab is book, or from the word inscribed. They use the word book. They know it's not the book of Revelation, because it's talking about it in the Revelation. They know it's not Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. They know it's not the five books of Moses, because they're not by far little. They say it must be some other book. That's what they keep saying. But they just don't want to match up with the book that they're talking about here. The little book that John saw, because John is seeing into the future, is a book that would come after theirs with the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit being the Ahmed Muhammad, that book is called the Quran. You know what the word Quran just happens to mean? No. It means to read something. And that's what they say. The word of the Mosai. To read something. Is what the word Quran means. You understand? The man couldn't read, so they named the scripture, read. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Couldn't read. And cried with a loud voice. This angel screamed out with a loud voice. As when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. So that's the seven plagues they were talking about previously. That's all the seven plagues that come to the end of the world, from the seven angels that were given the seven vials and the seven trumpets to blow. And each one of those angels blew a trumpet, and a certain thing took place in the world, which was the countdown to the end of the world after Jesus, before he comes. And when the seven thunders, which is the sound of their trumpets, had uttered, right, their voices, when they heard the sound of the trumpets, what? I, John, remember this is John, I, John, was about to write. And I heard a voice. And he heard a voice from heaven saying to him, what? Seal up those things which the seven thunders. You remember back in Isaiah, he said the same thing? About the man receiving the book which was sealed up? Remember Daniel, the same thing was said to the prophet Daniel? Seal up those words until the time of the end of the world? This is talking about a book at the end of the world. It's not talking about a book of the present day or the time of Jesus. It's talking about a final book. So John said, what he just saw in this book that was open, he was about to write. He was going to write from the Holy Quran. And here's what an angel told him. Oh no. Don't write this down. Do what? Write them not. Direct his attention to the creator of the heavens and the earth. And the first thing that the angel Gabriel told Muhammad when he was in the cave was Muhammad for him to read or recite this thing in the name of he who created him. Now what did John just say? And I swear by him who liveth forever and ever who created. They're giving you the first verse of the Quran right there. When he held up. He was read, now reciting what he had just read but wasn't allowed to write down. We now have available another 24 hours of True Light tapes by popular demand. Our master teacher and spiritual guide, Sayyid Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Mahdi, has for your listening pleasure and enlightenment a total of 48 hours of True Light tapes, answering all those questions scholars and professors can only guess the answer. 
covering this topic as, why use the books of the New Testament? Is Allah's name Jehovah? The 200 fallen angels, which Jesus do you follow, and much, much more. Ask your local Ansar representatives, the brothers dressed in white, for copies of the True Light tapes, numbers 1 through 48. If there are no Ansar representatives in your area, call or visit the original tents of Kedar. 717 Bushwick Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11221. Also, ask or write for a listing of the most dynamic books in history, authored by Sayyid al Imam Isa al Hadi al Mahdi. I used to be a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad until he died. Then I became a follower of his son, Wallace D. Muhammad. But I came to find out that he was not teaching the same thing as the messenger. Wallace D. Muhammad teaches that you can work for anybody, even the white man who is the devil. Wallace D. Muhammad teaches that the white man is not, even though the scriptures say the white man is the devil. Then I started reading books written by Imam Isa, and he explains the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings better than anybody I've ever heard, even Minister Farrakhan. Imam Isa teaches the importance of doing for self, just like Elijah taught us. Imam Isa also has his followers dressing in the garb of the prophets, like the Quran says. This is a devoted follower of Elias Selassie, the conquering land of Judah. And to I read the pamphlet written by the master Imam Isa about Margaret Garvey. I might learn much about how Margaret Garvey never wore dreadlocks, and how his Muslim name was Musa, and the color of his flag was red, black, and green. The same exact flag the Mahdi of Sudan fought under. After encountering the divine truth of the master Imam Isa, I am now devoted to the answers. And now, let us return to our broadcast. Okay, go ahead. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel... It is the end of the world when the seventh angel shall send it the last plague. Go ahead. When he shall begin to sound the mystery of God, it shall be finished. When the secrets, not mystery, the secrets shall be revealed. That means all those things that was hidden in those books for all those years, in the latter day, all the truth shall be unmasked, like Daniel said. They told him to seal up all those truths to the end of the world, mm -hmm. and John had to seal them up because there was no man found in heaven and earth, or on the earth, or beneath the earth, who had the power to open these books and reveal the meaning of these books, these seven seals. Now these things in the latter day, all the truths of them shall be made clear to you. The secrets of the scriptures are being made clear, simple. This is what he's talking about. Because of the Qur'an coming, because the Qur'an is Mubin, that which can clear things up. <laughs> Go ahead. As he hath declared to his servants the prophets. That tells you talking about the books that came to the prophets. The secrets of the prophecies of all the prophets must be cleared. Muhammad came to do that with the Qur'an, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Go ahead. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and open the earth. And upon the earth. So now he's telling John, go get the book out of the hand of, of this angel. angel. This angel has no boundaries. This is the angel Gabriel. He has no boundaries, earth nor sea, because they use in the scripture of Revelation boundaries of that which is on the earth, of the beast coming out the earth, or that beast which comes out of the sea, which limits his boundaries. This angel is without boundary. This is the angel Gabriel, who can travel with the messages of the Most High throughout the heavens or the earth. He tells John, go take the Quran out of his hand and do what? Oh, read it. That's right, go ahead, read it though. Oh, and I went into the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book, and he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. The angel tells him, Here, take this book and digest it. Eat it up means consume it, study it, read it, know it. And then he gives him another warning, like I said. He said, Knowing the truth is real sweet in the mouth, but practicing the law becomes very bitter in the stomach. Once y'all start reading the pamphlet, you feel great about what you're learning, about being Nubian. But then when someone says you got to stop partying, smoking, and put on a white jalabia, or a woman put on a veil and dress like the bride, because it tells you in the book of Revelation that you have to come prepared as a bride, adorned for a groom, and a bride who's adorned for a groom in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam comes in a long white dress with a veil on, so it tells the woman in the books of Revelation that she has to look like a bride, because John foresaw that women were dressed with veils on and long white robes. But that part you don't like. That's bitter. 
When we say you can't do this and you can't do that, that gets bitter. But the truth, knowing about who you are and knowing how you got here and who the Amorite is now, you say, I finally found out after 63 years that the white man is the devil. I knew it. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad was trying to tell us that, but it just wasn't explained. Now I see his name. He's an Amorite. He's a Jebusite. He's a Horite. Don't you say to yourself, hallelujah. You know what I say? Truth is truth. That's my favorite statement. Truth is truth. Whenever I hear the truth, I say, truth is truth. But it makes you feel good to know the truth, doesn't it? Because the truth will do what? Set you free. Make you free. Stop trying to get set free. Nobody ain't going to set you free because the Lord don't help a people until they help themselves. It'll make you free. When you have it, you got to know how to use it. It just won't pop up. And because you know it, you can say, I'm free. Because the white man walk right up and hit you in the head with a stick. And you realize it didn't make you free. But knowing the truth, you'll know how to set yourself free. Now that y'all got the truth and you know who you are, who he is, where you came from, what your language is, what your flag looks like, how you should eat, how you should dress, now you know the truth. That's sweet, isn't it? <laughs> but then when I say, you got to stop hanging out, you got to stop doing this, stop doing that, stop doing that, you say, oh, man, I don't want to move inside no community and give up everything I built up. I'm going to school to be a psychologist here. I'm working for this Jew, man. What am I telling him when he tell me? <laughs> the Almighty tells you he doesn't expect you to wait for the Jew. Or the Christian, because they won't let you pray five times a day. They make sure they set the schedule where you can't pray five times a day. You try to walk off your job on Friday afternoon. That's why they made most things get paid on Friday evening. If you get paid on Friday evening, you definitely won't walk off the job. But the Jews walk off on Friday evening to go keep their Sabbath. But they made sure they set the holidays up and your work schedule so you can't be a Muslim and work for him. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. What are you doing around Salatu Dor? In the afternoon, you either in school or at work, or on your lunch break. He got it fixed up. That's the devil. But those who bow and receive his mark, because they want wealth, because he said the mark of the devil is on two places, on the hand and on the forehead. And those who have it in their hand neither buy nor sell. That means the mark of the hand is symbolizing money. And that's what it is. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. And it's us pursuing this man's money and chasing after the things that he promises us that has us living in the city, digesting pollution, subjecting our children to crack and rape and insanity, but we stay inside this city. Well, we could move back down south, we can move over to Puerto Rico, we can go back to Jamaica and set up and live by a farm, raise our own food. No, we get back to Jamaica, you know the first thing we want to do? We want to go to Kingston. We get back to Trinidad, the first place we want to go is Port of Spain. We get down south to South Carolina, we run right to Charleston. We're not going out to the hills and get our own farmland and raise our kids. We love the devil so much, even when we go home, we go right to him. Him. We go to his cap. What does the word capital mean? Money. That's why he calls the capital. <laughs> Every city you go in and say, what's the capital of the city? Where's all the money at? <laughs> so all the black people run to the money. So the love of money is the root of all Not having money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. And we pursue that money and get the mark of the beast. That's what's killing our people. Because we won't turn back and just live by the earth raise our children in healthy, clean environments. We're willing to stay in this polluted New York City and suffer just to receive a check from the white man. <laughs> I hate to tell you that, but truth is truth. Go ahead. It says that... Um, Let's finish the quote because we're in a oh. section of Revelation that we can get to the end of it, then you can ask me anything you want. And I'm number nine, right? That's right. And I went... And I went unto the angel and said unto him... I just read that one already. That's right. Give me the little book. Ten. And he said unto me... Take it and, and eat, eat it, up, it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter. And sweet in your mouth. You understand what that means? Now, let's be for real. How many of y'all people have found the truth very sweet in the mouth? Tell the truth. Can you raise your hands if you're honest? <laughs> be honest. Don't be afraid. And how many of y'all have found it bitter when we tell you what you got to start giving up? But we have to sacrifice it. He who endures to the end, he shall receive the crown of life. Go ahead. Ten now. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth, sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. <laughs> when I started, what John said, when I studied the Holy Quran and started reading it, wow, this truth was sweet. But then when I started in, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't get drunk, I can't, I got my woman got to wear a veil, I can't, he said, that this guy, it turned like a sour food in my stomach. I mean, I like the way it sounds, but I don't like having to stop doing this, and I can't go here, and I can't do that. Now, 11 is... And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many people. Why does he tell John he must prophesy or predict again? Because the book of St. John was revealed to John in the year 98. The book of Revelation was given to him for Jesus in the year 96. That's why they got to know their scriptures and their history. 
and the book of St. John is given to him in the year 98. So, what I'm saying is, the prediction that John predicted about Muhammad coming was after he received the revelation. Then he was told, now go out and predict to people about this man, Muhammad, who's going to come. Because after him and the seven angels, then Jesus will come. But we got to get past the next book, this little book you just read, that you can't write because the time ain't right. Then we'll go to the plagues of the seven angels and all the vows and the curses that will be upon the world. And then in the latter day, the Messiah will come. If we don't get past the Holy Spirit, Muhammad, and get past the Quran, Jesus ain't going to be here. So John, get on the ball and get off this island and go out there and teach a new gospel. What did John do? Prophesize again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. And what was that? That prophecy that John prophesied, let's go to book St. John chapter 1 verse 1. This is the book he received in the year 98. He said in the beginning was the Word. He went right back to the beginning of creation like as if it's Genesis. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He said the original Word and declaration of the Word in itself was God. The same was in the beginning with God. That word meaning life in itself, existence, kun fire kun, be. All things were made by him, and without him there was not anything made that was made. He's not worshiping Jesus here. He's worshiping the heavenly Father who made and created Jesus. Because he got the word to go do this. Then he goes on and says, In him was life, and the life was the light in man. And the light shineth in the darkness, yet the darkness comprehended it not. In this creator was life. This is the law, who is the breath of life. And that life was the light of man. And he blew that spirit into man, and man became a living soul. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. Now it goes right back to what John was told to do in Revelation chapter 1. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. He came to really bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. So now he's telling them that John was given the revelation. And John was the one who was sent to bear witness of the light. Two was which two? The light of the Almighty and the Ruh, which is Ruhu Kudus, or who is called Ruhu Allah, Jesus, the light of Allah. Both lights are there. Because first he created everything and then from that Jesus came. Watch, he goes on to say it. The same meaning John came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Because they'll get their revelation from the book of Revelation is what Jesus said, believe in. Read Revelation 22 and you'll see it. Revelation 22, the last chapter, the 19th verse. Mm -hmm. Let's say start with the 18th again. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of uh, the prophecy of what? This book. Of this book. But Paul told them to read his books to get the understanding. Jesus in the Revelation from the Most High is telling you, you get all your truth out of the book of Revelation. This book. And what else would it say? If any man shall add unto these things, God will add unto him the plagues that are written in what? In this book. This book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in, this in book. what? This, this book. book. <laughs> This is what John is talking about. He ain't telling people to read all the other books. He's telling them that if you want to find your way to Christ, you better read this book. And then when you read that book, and you get to the 10th chapter, it tells you another book, a little book is coming. All that was done after. And after that it tells him, now John, go back and predict to the people about that Muhammad coming. And he took him back to this book that I'm holding now, John 1. And what does it say? Number 8. He was not the light but was sent to bear witness of the light. John was not the Messiah himself. He was only oh. sent to bear witness of the Messiah. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh in the world. Jesus was called Ruhu Allah, the Spirit of Allah. So therefore, the Ruhu is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the Spirit that lighteth every man that comes into the world. What did he say? He was in the world, and the world was made by him. But the world knew him not. Every man has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moving in him, the breath of life. The Quran says it and the Bible. But man don't understand and can't control Allah. He is controlled by Allah. He's in the world. The world was made by him, yet the world does not know. If you can't say, I know Allah personally, you'd be a nut. Number 11. Oh, he came unto his own. Stop. Who did Jesus come to? His own. Did he come to the Gentiles? No. Did he come to the Jews? The so-called Jew who he clearly mentions in Revelation are those who say they are but are not. 
He came to the lost tribe of the house of Israel, only the tribe of Judah. He came to his own. Judah, but what happened? And his own received him not. But his own people, the Judites, didn't receive him. Now they say, but as many... As received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. But the Christians say as many, they try to say, see, this means everybody. No. You got to finish the whole thought from 11 straight on down. He came unto his own, comma, and his own received him not, period. But as many as received him, comma, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. Of God. Even to them that believe in his name, semicolon. Which meant that Jesus is saying, I came to the Israelites, the lost tribe, Judah, but they didn't accept me. But as many of them that do accept me, they can become the sons of Allah again. Not as many as the world that accept me. Just his own people. Otherwise he wouldn't have said, I was not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel only. 13. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This Messiah was not born of what? Of blood. It was not a hereditary thing. It was not by the will of that. It wasn't by sexual desires and pleasures. It was not because some man just wanted to have a son. He was born because it was a prediction that Jesus would come. By the will of the Most High. It wasn't born the way most of us were born. Because our parents were having a good time. Or they felt it was just time to have a kid. He was a man born out of due time. He was born as a prophecy fulfilled to the house of Israel. That he would come, the Messiah. Go ahead. And the word was made flesh and dwell among and us. Dwell among us. Forget the commas, because the commas the Christians add in. Them commas mean it doesn't really belong there. Okay. That's their interpretation. Jesus is called Rahulullah. He had the spirit of Allah. He did come down as flesh. And anybody that does not believe that Jesus came in the flesh is an antichrist. He did come down in the flesh. All right? Go ahead. Not Allah. He came down because the spirit, the angel Gabriel, personified as a well-made man. 1919 of the Holy Quran uses the word. He gave him. Jesus was given to Mary by way of the angel Gabriel. From the angel Gabriel. Okay, you want to add the brackets you get. And we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. That's Jesus. John bore witness of him. And cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me. For he was before me. Even though Jesus was coming after him, Jesus was created before him, he's saying. Because mm -hmm. he was created in spirit first, right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Because of Jesus, now we got grace. We got forgiveness. If we follow what he says, we'll get forgiveness. But they didn't. They didn't follow it. Go ahead what he says right after that. For the law was given by Moses, and but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Why don't the Christians live by the law of Moses? The Bible says so. What was the law of Moses? Where is the Sabbath according to Moses? On Saturday, not on Sunday. What are they doing in the church on Sunday? Worshiping the sun god, thou. Why don't they live by the law of Moses? Why aren't the women wearing veils? Jacob's wife wore a veil. Why they shun polygamy? Abraham had three wives. Solomon had... 200 wives and Jacob had four wives. Why they make it look like it's some Islamic curse when a man talks about born one wife when it came out of the Old Testament? Why they make the veil look like it's some Islamic curse when it's something you can find right in the books of Genesis? You follow what I'm saying? Why are they not living by the laws of Moses? Because they're being ruled by the devil. The devil stepped in and pulled out the law of Moses and gave you all the law of a man named Paul who openly confesses that he wants people to read his books in order to be saved in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So did Jesus see him? No. No. So how could he be with him in the beginning and not see him? Say that again. How could Jesus be with God in the beginning yet not see him? Uh -huh. As a man, he cannot make that claim. As a spirit, he can. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites, Levites. Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and, and denied not, not, but confessed. I am, I am not. not. I'm not what? The Christ. I ain't the Messiah. Don't hit me. So what they asked him next? And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Then they asked him again. Are thou that prophet? What prophet? We covered three things here, remember? We covered, is he the Messiah Christ? He said no. 
asked him, are you Elijah? He said no, because he didn't know any better. And then they finally asked him, are you... Prophet. Which prophet was destined to come after Jesus? Muhammad. There's no other man who came with a book who glorified Jesus' name and taught the same thing that Jesus taught. What did Jesus teach? What we call in Islam, Tawheed. Wahtahu la sharika lahu. That there's only one deity and him alone shall we serve with our partners. That's what they all taught. Ashadu la ilaha illallah wahtahu la sharika lahu. You understand? Yes. Okay, y'all can move on. I just want to add that in the same quote of John, I would like y'all to go to 41 while we're here, because they keep referring to him as Christ here, but the disciples are going to tell you who they found. In uh, St. John 1, verse 41. He first finds it his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, interpreted the Christ. Who is it that they said they found? The Messiah. Why are they interpreting to Christ that they know he's the Messiah? Mm -hmm. Because in Greek they can turn the Christ into God. You see that? Mm -hmm. But in Hebrew, the Messiah is only an anointed king. As David in Psalms 2 is called the Messiah. If you turn to Psalms 2, you find that David is called the anointed. The word anointed, Mesha, or Meshach in Hebrew, Messiah, is Messiah. Why do the heathens rage? That means anybody who's not of Israel. And the people imagine vain things, foolish, crazy notions. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and His anointed. anointed. So that word anointed is the word Messiah in Hebrew, Meshach. If they had left that word to say without translating that, they would have the same thing they have in the books of John about Jesus. That the kings Right? And they take counsel against the sustainer and against his Messiah. Only this one is not Jesus. This is talking about David again. And he, go, he also called him his only begotten in here also. In 7. I will declare a decree. The Lord has said unto me. Talking to David. What? Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Same thing Christians claim about Jesus. They said about David. This is my son. This day have I begotten thee. You are the anointed Messiah. Same thing. Okay? And if you read, like I said, Psalms on your own time, Psalm 22 and Psalm 72, write that down. You'll hear the whole story of the crucifixion, only it's not pertaining to Jesus, it's pertaining to David. John, the author of John, St. John, is the same author of Revelation, right? Yes. See, let me tell you what I just did. I just finished this week translating the book of John, totally. Uh -huh. That's finished. I finished this week the whole book of Revelation. It's finished, uh -huh. translated from the original language, and it's going to be put out in book form. So you're right on time. Okay. Okay, there's something in Romans chapter 8 that I don't understand. It's chapter 8, verse 7 to 9. It says... I'll go through this with you. I don't believe in the book of Romans, because Romans is written by Paul. Uh -huh. All right, but I'll try to answer it. What's Romans 1? Yes. Okay, chapter what? Eight, seven to nine. Okay, uh -huh. go ahead. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, mm -hmm. for it is not subject to the law of Allah, neither indeed can be. So then they that, they that are in the flesh cannot please Allah, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And so be that the spirit of Allah dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Right. They're talking about sex right here. Mm -hmm. They say the cardinal mind, mm -hmm. that's the physical mind. They're saying that the cardinal mind, lust, will dominate the very spiritual. That's why they refer to, in the book of Revelation, as the harlot of Babylon, having a mysterious name. Her mystery name is pornography. Mm -hmm. And pornography is not just sex. Pornography is bathing suits and short pants and tight dresses and tight pants, tight blouses, you know what I'm saying? And that's how fine new she is. This Paul is talking basically about the fact that if you have Christ in you, the devil cannot get inside you. If you become Christ-like, the devil will not possess you. Mm -hmm. That's all he's really saying. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم 
علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم صدق الله العظيم That was the first five verses of Surat Al-Alaq originally revealed to the Prophet Muhammad as the first chapter it is today recorded as the 96th as translated by as Sayyid Al-Imam Isa Al-Hadi Al-Mahdi it reads as follows O seal of the Prophet of Allah, Muhammad by the supreme sovereignty of your sustainer and creator, you are being ordered to read by beginning with the name of your illustrious sustainer, who is the creator of all things. He, Allah, created all human beings of a self-separating. So read, because your sustainer is most generous. He, Allah, taught human beings what they would have never known. Thank you. 